Hi. In the previous video we have introduced first order logic. In this video we will use first order logic to formulate the axioms of zermelo frankel set theory. I assume that you are familiar with naive set theory, but with first order logic for the first time we can write down what the axioms of set theory really are, so that we can replace intuitive arguments about sets by arguments that just use these axioms. First, we have to fix the signature. The signature of set theory is remarkably simple. We just need a single binary relation symbol used in infix notation, namely for the relation that we intend to use for A is an element of B. So with our first order formulas and uh, sentences, we will be talking about structures whose elements we imagine as sets. And now we can start writing down the properties that we expect from this relation. For a better readability, I introduce some intuitive and well-known shortcuts. For example, you write B subset C for the first order formula that says for all A, if A is an element of B, then A is an element of C. So all elements of B are elements of C. I will now present the zermelo frankel axioms abbreviated by ZF. So this is a theory in the signature that I just presented. The first axiom is called extensionality. It says that if two sets have the same elements, then they are equal. To translate this into logic, we use the universal quantifier. We say for all x and y, if x is a subset of y and y is a subset of x, then x and y are equal. Recall that first order logic allows the equality symbol no matter what the signature is. The second axiom is called empty set. There exists a set that has no elements. Because of extensionality, this set, which has no elements, is unique. And we introduced a well-known symbol for the empty set to denote this element. The third axiom of set F is the pairing axiom. For all sets A, B, there is a set C which has exactly the elements A and B. Written in first order logic, this can be expressed by saying that for all x, x is an element of C if and only if x equals A or x equals B. Again, extensionality implies that given A and B, this set C is unique. And we use the shortcut curly brackets AB to denote this set. Most of the remaining axioms also look like this. They state that certain sets must exist. The fourth axiom of set F is the union axiom. It states that for every set A, there exists a set B that contains precisely the elements of the elements of A. In first order logic, this can be expressed by the formula that says that x is an element of b if there is an element y of a such that x is an element of y. By extensionality, this set b only depends on a and is denoted by uh, a big union symbol in front of a. Axiom number five is the power set axiom. It states that for every set a, there exists a set b that contains precisely the subsets of a. So for every x, x is an element of b if and only if x is a subset of a. This set b is denoted by curly p of a for power set. Axiom 6 is the infinity axiom. We would like to assert the, the existence of infinite sets. One way to do this is to claim that there exists a set a, which contains the empty set, so it's not empty, and which is closed under forming the successor. The successor of x is the union of x with the set that just contains x. Union is something that you surely know from naive set theory, of course, but we have not yet defined this notation in our axiomatic set theory. A union B is another way of writing big cup applied to the two element set that contains A and B. So in our case, the two element set that contains x and the union of x. In first order logic, the infinity axiom reads as follows. There exists a set A containing the empty set, such that for every element of A, 
there is also the successor of that element in the set A. Axiom number seven is called comprehension. And it is actually not just one sentence, but infinitely many. This is where the hand-waving starts, even for the more ambitious, naive set theory introductions uh, in the first year of your mathematics or computer science curriculum. The reason is that already for stating this axiom, you have to talk about first-order formulas. For every formula phi over the signature of set theory, we have the following axiom. For all y0, y1, up to ym, there exists a set that contains precisely those elements of y0 that satisfy phi. Again, this set z is unique by extensionality, and we have the following notation for z, which you all know and you use every day. We write curly brackets and then x in y0, vertical line, and then comes the condition that x must satisfy in order to be an element of that set. In our case, it must satisfy the formula phi. These comprehension axioms are quite strong. And together with the previous axioms, we can deduce many, many statements in mathematics just from these axioms. The axioms we have seen so far are called Zermelo set theory, abbreviated just by Z. Let's have a look at an example. I claim that Z implies the following sentence. There does not exist an A such that all Z are in A. In other words, there is no set containing all sets. This might be counterintuitive to some of you, and this is why it is called an antinomy, namely Russell's antinomy. So let's prove this from Z, from Zermelo set theory. Suppose that U is a structure over the signature of set theory that satisfies this sentence. So there is an element A of the structure U that contains all other elements of U. Then we can apply comprehension to the first order formula X does not contain X. So there is a set B that contains precisely those elements X of A that satisfy X is not in X. And now we might ask the question, is B an element of B? Well, B is an element of B only if B is in A. Well, this is always satisfied since A contains all sets. So we can forget about this condition. We only have to check the condition after the vertical line. So we get that B is in B if and only if B is not in B. This is the condition after the vertical line. And this is an obvious contradiction. So proof finished, proof by contradiction finished. So you think, oh cool, Z seems just like the right thing to work with. Uh, and this is what Zermelo also thought, until Frankel came. In fact, in 1922, two mathematicians, namely Frankel and Skolem, independently from each other, discovered that Zermelo set theory is not strong enough to cover all statements that we naively would accept as valid axioms. The reason is that Z does not imply the existence of some sets whose existence we would like to assume. I will give an example. Let Z0 be the natural numbers. That is the set N that contains exactly the elements 0, 1, 2, and so on. We will later see how to code the natural numbers in Zermelo set theory. Let Z1 be the power set of N. And let Z2 be the power set of the power set of N. And in general, let Zi plus 1 be the power set of Zi. All these sets exist in Zermelo set theory, no problem. But... How about the set that contains all of those Zi? It turns out that Z does not imply the existence of this set. This is what Frankel saw in 1922 and what he then fixed by introducing an axiom that is stronger than comprehension. This will be axiom number eight and comes after the break. Thank you.
Eben hoch ist ein Volk gekriegt hier. Ja, eben. To define the remaining axioms of ZF, we need some fundamental concepts. An ordered pair, AB, is the set that has just two elements, namely the set that just contains A and the set that contains exactly A and B. This set surely exists by our axioms, namely by the pairing axiom. A binary relation is a set of ordered pairs. A function is a relation f such that if x and y is in f and x and z is in f, then y must be equal to z. Instead of x and y, or the pair x and y is in f, we write f of x equals y. All of these definitions you surely know, but you might now see them in a different light, knowing first order logic. The domain of a function f is the set of all x, such that there exists a y with f of x equals y. This expression is not covered by the comprehension axiom. The reason is that x is not guarded by some set. In our notation for comprehension, x must be an element of some set that we already know to exist. But in this case here, it is easy because we, we know that x will be an element of the union of the union of f. So by comprehension, we can be sure that the set I wrote down, the domain of f, really exists. Similarly, we define the image of f as the set of all y such that there exists an x with f of x equals y. If the image of f is contained in some set b, we use the well-known notation f colon domain f to b. In this notation, b can be larger than the image of f. Now comes axiom 8, the replacement axiom. Actually, it is again infinitely many axioms, so it should rather be called an axiom scheme. Let me first give you the idea. Note that if u satisfies Zermelo's axioms and s is a subset of the domain of u, in the naive sense, then there might not be an element a in u that contains exactly the elements of s. So s is only a set on the meta level, not an element of u. Likewise, if f is a function from u to u in the naive sense, then it might not be a function in the sense we just defined. And in particular, the image of a set d under f might not be an element of u. Note that if f would be a set, then the image of d under f is also a set, again by comprehension. If we would add the existence of the image of d under f, for functions f in the naive sense, we would create a contradiction in our axiom system similar to Russell's antinomy. So the idea of the replacement axiom is that we only add the existence of the image of d under f for definable functions. In first order logic, this can be formulated as follows. For every first order formula phi in, in the signature of set theory, with three variables v1 up to vn, x and y, we add the following axiom. We say that if phi defines a function, which can be expressed in first order logic by saying that for every x there is at most one y that satisfies phi, then there exists an element u, which is the image of d under the function defined by phi. Let me first write this as a first order formula and then explain the formula. So in this formula, we specify exactly what the elements of this set uh, u are. It's precisely those elements y, such that there exists an x in d, which is mapped to y under the function defined by phi. Finally, there is an axiom, which is perhaps the least important, called the axiom of foundation. Perhaps for aesthetic reasons, we would like to exclude that sets can be their own element. 
and we even formulate something stronger. Namely, every non-empty set X has an element Y such that the intersection of X and Y is empty. In other words, every set X has an element which is minimal with respect to the element relation. So we don't want infinite descending chains with respect to the element relation. In this way, of course, we also prevent that there is a set with uh, A element A, because that would also give an infinite descending chain with respect to the element relation. So what I have drawn here on the right in red is not possible if you assume foundation. The axioms one up to nine is referred to as zermelo frankel set theory, short ZF. In set theory, we distinguish between sets and classes. This is motivated by the desire to speak, for example, about the class of all finite graphs. There is no set of all finite graphs. Otherwise, we would derive a contradiction similarly as in the proof of Russell's antinomy. The reason is simply that the vertices of a graph can be arbitrary sets. So a set of all graphs would give you the power to talk about the set of all sets. And then we can reproduce the contradiction from Russell's antinomy. It is possible to give an axiomatic and clean treatment of the distinction between sets and classes in ZF. Let U be a model of ZF. We now consider the expansion of U by new constant symbols. For each element of U, we introduce a new constant symbol that denotes that element. We write U subscript U for the expanded structure. Now, the subsets of U that are definable over U subscript, subscript U are called classes. Note that every set A, so every element of U, gives rise to a class CA, namely the class defined by the formula X is an element of A. She's kinda dead for me. Just got it all. She danced with me. Her hands round my neck, still killing me.